30 years ago, Rwanda was in the middle of a violent civil war. Now it is building a $300 million innovation hub in the capital city of Kigali. The Kigali Innovation City is the government's flagship program aimed at creating a high-tech ecosystem that is centered around innovation and talent. The site opened up in December of 2021 and construction is scheduled for completion by March of 2023. More than 600 entrepreneurs already use the site daily and by completion, the site's expected to attract more than 1,000 workers per day. Rwanda President Paul Kagame hopes to transform the country into a middle income country by the year 2035. Joining me to discuss this is Ifosa Ujoma. He is the co-author of The Prosperity Paradox. I love that title, how innovation can lift nations out of poverty. Ifosa, I wanna thank you for joining us, my brother. Thanks a lot, Mark. It's good to be with you. How can innovation help lift nations out of poverty? A lot of times we think about World Bank help. We think about you know, the WTO. We think about IMF. We don't think about innovation. Tell me how it helps. Well, innovation is at the core of development. Um, and one of the struggles innovation has is it's not as uh, you can't you can't quite touch it like like a law or a policy, an institution or infrastructure. You can see all those things. But innovation is actually what drives these things. But what do I mean by innovation, uh, Mark? Well, innovation uh, the, the innovations that help uh, nations prosper are really products and services uh, that are made simple so many other people can afford them. If you think about Africa as, as an example, over the past 20 years, uh, we've seen the proliferation of this device, the mobile phone. Now, 20 years ago, you go to any country in Africa, people would say, not possible. There's no way their infrastructure is bad. Institutions are bad. Corruption's everywhere. Yeah, but I, I literally remember hearing, I, remember, I literally remember being uh, in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa in particular, but all throughout yeah. the continent and hearing that very argument about, about the incapacity to build cell towers, about you know the lack of market penetration in terms of people have yeah. accessing uh, mobile phone. I mean, everything you're saying is it's stunning to see 20 years ago that they said it wasn't possible in, on, a, on that continent. And, and today we have uh, over a billion subscriptions of mobile phones provided 20, Ooh. 30 billion dollars worth of tax revenues to governments across the continent, providing or generating about three million or so jobs. That's the power of innovation, but it's somewhat invisible. What I often tell people to do is go back to America 100, 150 years ago. We had similar demographics to many countries in Africa. I would even argue worse demographics when you look at child labor, when you look at maternal mortality, infant mortality. One of the things that happened in this country was our ability to democratize access to products and services so many people could afford it. And that created prosperity that we see in America, albeit unequal, but it did lead sure. to the richest country in the world. That's the power of innovation. Well, Paul Kagame, the Rwandan president, of course, uh, says that the kind of prosperity he imagines uh, innovation to be able to produce is the country becoming middle income by the year 2035. Now, that ain't but 12 years from now. To transform Rwanda into a middle income country in 12 years, that's a heck of a trajectory. Uh, is that really feasible? I think it's possible uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, Rwanda is a small country, uh, geographically speaking and population-wise. Number two, we now live in a world where di if you build your digital infrastructure, you can have a lot of workers live, work, and play in Rwanda, but they're serving uh, companies in countries all over the world. And so that's also possible. When you invite those high-income jobs well, people have to live somewhere, people have to eat, people have to do leisure, uh, check out the city, uh, tourism, and so on. And so what, what ultimately happens is those types of jobs generate other types of jobs in the country. And so it is possible, uh, but it's going to take a heck of a lot of work, a singular vision, um, and necessary investments in not just saying we want to create the, the, the jobs, but in education, um, in the financial services space. So we have to figure out a but way here's to my, Here's my concern, Ifosa, uh, mm -hmm. and, and I, to be clear, 
I have full faith in African people's capacity to be self-sustaining, to engage in self-determination. I have nothing but confidence in our ability. My concern is the corrupting forces are outside that continue to underdevelop Africa. When I go to countries on the continent, so often I see amazing developments in technology, amazing yeah. uh, expansions in education. But so often I see China, I see India, I see other nations taking control of it, whether I'm in Tanzania, whether I'm in South Africa, wherever. I, I see so much of other people there. So my question is, what good is innovation if we don't have control over it? And how do we keep control over it? Well, Mark, you know, the question you asked was very specific about Rwanda. Now, if you look yes. at Rwanda, fair, fair. if you look, if fair. you asked about Africa, I'd, I'd, I'd give a different, a different response. Um, but if you look at Rwanda, the government is really making a very concerted and strategic effort to ensure that the skills of Rwandans are built, uh, that the institutions in Rwanda support Rwandans, so it can invite investments from abroad, but it makes sure that. Rwandans develop the talent uh, to, to build many of these innovations that ultimately serve Rwandans and folks uh, outside the country. I think that's the, that's the you've hit on the nail on the head, uh, even when we look at development across Africa. But if you don't figure out a way to skill up your people, uh, then I'm afraid uh, you'll remain poor for the, the rest of your life. We've seen uh, Innovation City already having an economic impact. Uh, talk to me about what's happened in Rwanda so far. Uh, a, a lot's happened so far. So uh, Norskin, uh, which is uh, a, a, a sort of a, a development uh, a type venture venture capital uh, a agency, uh, has built uh, this this innovation uh, park in Rwanda to to bring in uh, tons of entrepreneurs. Uh, you have African Leadership University, which was built and and, and run by Fred Swanaker, who's an African. Uh, you have Carnegie Mellon. Uh, that has decided to build a campus in Kigali there, educating people. Uh, you have the Rwanda Coding Academy, uh, which is taking in an influx of young entrepreneurs, teaching them coding skills and helping them uh, find jobs. And you have a very important program called the Mass Service Digitization Program that is spearheaded by the Rwandan government, where they want to digitize all the government services so that the average Rwandan who has access to a phone can get a birth certificate, a marriage license, and a, a register a business and so on. That's incredibly important because when you step back and look at the growth of Silicon Valley, we think, you know, high tech, VC, um, young, scrappy entrepreneurs, um, but we forget that it was uh, the birth well, perhaps not the birthplace, but incredibly important as a defense uh, uh, center, right? Uh, there was a lot of research for the Navy um, and radio technology, which ultimately bled into, you know, computing and silicone and so on. And so if Rwanda can figure out a way to get this right, this nice uh, recipe, I think Paul Kagame's dream can come true. I do. Well, we'll certainly have our eyes peeled to see if that happens. Thank you so much for joining me. Ifosa, it's a pleasure as always to hear your brilliant insights. Thank you, Mark.